Good morning and welcome to today's uh, panel discussion of implementing BioStrips. This webinar is a first in the series of four webinars being hosted by the Western Lake Erie Conservation Authorities that are going to be held on the next few Tuesdays in March. All of them will be at 11 a.m. If you're watching live today, uh, you have access to all of the upcoming webinars as well as the recorded ones. Today's presentation is uh, funded in part by both the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. Thank you to uh, those who have filled in the poll. Um, it's cool to see uh, the diversity of the communities and uh, the counties that are represented today. My name is Jessica Van Zwool and I am the Healthy Watershed Specialist at St. Clair Conservation and I will be your host today. I'm gonna wrap up that poll in a few seconds and we'll get going. Uh, throughout the presentations, you are encouraged to ask questions in the uh, Q&A section. And you will notice that at the bottom of your screen, uh, we'll answer the questions at the end unless there's a need for clarification. The chat feature is open the entire time, um, but please direct your questions to, in, to the Q&A so I, uh, I'll be sure to see them. Wow, we have someone from Austria. Sorry, thank you for joining us today. Um, and if you are a certified crop advisor who is looking to get CEU credits, we will have the QR code and my email address up at the very end of the presentation for you. We are talking about biostrips today and other best agricultural best management practices in this webinar series because they are all examples of green infrastructure. Biostrips and other BMPs are just tools in the green infrastructure toolbox that can provide a variety of environmental, social, and economic benefits. Green infrastructure can be adopted in both urban and rural settings. And green infrastructure differs from gray in that gray infrastructure is typically designed to um, function for, have one primary function. Green infrastructure can provide multiple functions and benefits. And green infrastructure can be more adaptable to environmental fluctuations and stressors than traditional gray infrastructure. Green infrastructure can also enhance agricultural resiliency to those stressors and fluctuations uh, by reducing the impact of heavy rain and extreme heat days. They can also provide services that are better able to recover after or following extreme weather events. They can provide food and habitat, and they can increase that connectivity between larger natural heritage features. These are just some examples of green infrastructure found in agriculture. And if you are planning or thinking about um, implementing any of these types of projects, definitely be sure to reach out to your local conservation authority as they may have uh, grants or different assistance in helping you implement these projects. Without further ado, I am going to turn it over to our first panelist, uh, Patrick Berkeley, who is a poultry and cash crop farmer from Adelaide Metcalf. Patrick? Unmute, uh, share screen, desktop two. And then uh, play. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, I sh I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the way I've been looking at this as as polycultures and from a young person's perspective. So, um, Patrick Berkeley, uh, I farm here in Adelaide Metcalf, uh, Clydale Farms. Uh, started that 2017. But I graduated in 2015 from the University of Waterloo School of Architecture. Um, and a lot of my perspective comes from that. So 
I didn't have that typical experience. I, I went into a program that was predominantly um, urban focused. Architecture is a very urban uh, endeavor. And my classmates were, you know, grew up downtown Toronto. Like they didn't have driver's licenses when they got to school. It was a very urban uh, case. Um, being the farmer and always trying to bridge that gap, I was trying to figure out what can I do in this program to bring architecture to the agriculture to the urban. Um, kept looking at uh, in projects, but what I kept finding was that um, uh, when I do these projects, my professors were trying to get me to look at different things and they they kept pushing me to look at the likes of Mark Shepard, New Forest Farm, or Joel Salatin, Polyface Farm. And one professor was wanting me to read this book, uh, The Omnivore's Dilemma. And I just, I couldn't get it. I did, it just wasn't like, I saw why it was kind of interesting, but I didn't understand why it was valuable. Um, until I stumbled upon this video, which was, uh, it's just a five minute video. If you want to check it out, there's a QR link for it. Um, but it's just, the video distilled down the key point that I wasn't grasping before, which was uh, trying to actually get biology to work for you um, and, and to leverage the benefits of the interactions that happen within a biological system. Um, once I got that, then I started playing. It's like, okay, so if you've got all these plants that start to interact, how does that shape what the landscape would look like in these, in these projects? So started trying to figure out how to quantify it and it's really hard, but also trying to figure out how would you implement that in a larger scale thing. So then you see that that one image there of, of um, me looking at like sort of like a, a big, like a Miller Pro type sprayer um, with planter units out front or who knows, it's, that's what got me thinking. And then this was sort of the final project that I ended up having for the one semester, which was looking at alley cropping and how do these, all these systems go together. Um, but that was, it's all rather impractical and, and fancy things. So how do I bring it home? How do I make it, it real? Um, so needed a place to start. Uh, first year, I just said, can we do like three acres of plant green in the sort of right around the barn? Um, just it built my experience with it. I was kind of interested in the no-till organic stuff. So, hey, we'll see what, we'll see how that works. Um, give it a try. Uh, next year, I thought, well, I kind of want to push this. And I sort of been, I discovered that idea of the, of the, of the alleys um, as a way to mechanize these complex systems. And um, so I ended up uh, building those dividers that were in next, uh, drill and Nick's sitting right beside me here. Um, and so did like split that plot in half and did half for corn, no-till organic with cereal rye. And then the other half was this, uh, relay organic, uh, with the cereal rye where the beans would go. So there's pictures of planting it. There's pictures of, of roller, roller crimping it. Um, and then the right is planting the beans into the inter row. Um, Unfortunately, that didn't work out all that great. Uh, weeds had a different mind of their own and uh, I kind of got stuck trying to figure out how to pull back from it. Um, ended up having to do a tactical retreat where I just mowed it all down. Um, lessons were learned. Uh, I came back at it trying to figure out, all right, let's narrow the focus down. How do we actually build a system that I can manage? Um, that's when I started looking at going back to the more conventional relay cropping. And that's, that's, I think that's the interesting is I'm coming at relay cropping, coming at it from it being more conventional than what I was doing as opposed to uh, more risky. Um, what you see on the left there is planting uh, wheat and oats interplanted and then the spring those oats died out. So then I'm ready to plant beans come the next spring um, and end up having to replant that one year. But uh, also had to figure out some weed management. So Nick came over and did some spraying for me, but then also I had to do some inter row spraying. So that's where we, you know, grabbed the Rubbermaid containers and, and Jerry rigged it up behind the neighbor's um, little sprayer and, and made it work. So there's a picture of the relay cropping beforehand um, uh, right after wheat harvest and then sort of getting close to season. Um, 
small acres uh, harvest is fun still. So uh, I got twice the harvest on that plot. Um, trying to move that forward, uh, start looking at uh, the 60 inch corn and bio strips. So whereas the, the relay cropping was trying to harness for the, the sunlight in the spring and in the fall to make a, a con conventional cash crop uh, harness more of that sunlight, this is now looking at um, what can I do to re reduce my costs and and also create a bit more space for biodiversity be to happen in the interstitial space. So um, cut back corn populations by you know half. So it's only planting sixteen thousand plants per acre, um, but I'm now getting that corn plant to do a bit more. A lot most of those corn plants produce two cobs instead of the one, um, and for with half the seed cost, I still got like. 90%, 95% of, of the yield. So um, there's just some quick pictures of the harvest. Um, the, the big thing that I always ran into was that there's, there's the urban ideal and then there's the rural reality. Um, and uh, there's ideas on how they would let, how the urban would like us to farm. Um, and then there's the harsh realities of, well, what is, does that actually make any sense? So that's where it comes back to, does this excel? Can we meet uh, these societal expectations while still making it pencil. Um, you can come back to this hopefully and take a look more closely at those numbers, but um, the the Coles notes of it is that um, in a two or three year rotation, I see potential um, for, you know, 80, $100 return over conventional. Um, so to me, question is does it pencil maybe um it needs more trial it needs more work but uh i'm still just i think that's a reason to try so uh thanks awesome thank you patrick and next up we have nick stockman uh who is a livestock and crop farmer near strathroy he has nick has held a long-term and has been long-term involved in Middlesex Soil and Crop Improvement Association on the Strathmere Lodge uh, demonstration farm. And Nick states that soil health is a long-term investment. Thanks, Jessica. The farm is livestock based, laying hens and crops, uh, corn, IP soys, hard red winter wheat with single cut red clover cover crop. Soil is mostly clay with some clay loam and silty clay loam. The fields have not had primary tillage for 30 plus years. Clay fields are tiled at either 20 or 25 feet, while the clay loam field is at 40 feet. Organic matter ranges from 2.4 to 5, while fertility for P is anywhere from 20 to 95, and K is anywhere from 60 to 190. And this is soil optics data with real uh, soil tests as well. Uh, from 2020 and 2019. Next slide. No-till wheat into soy stubble and soy no-till into corn stubble are not an issue. It's the corn into the wheat stubble cover crop that can be the challenging part of the rotation on the clay-based soils. Taking straw off and a pass with the Case IH Turbo 330 co-owned with a neighbor has been used in the fall or some strip till custom done has been utilized to try to get some black soil that will absorb sunshine in the spring to warm and dry up the soil ahead of corn planting. Where added fertility, especially pea is needed, mechanical strip tillage is an appropriate method of incorporating the added fertilizer in the strip. But with the, pea, the high pea soil tests in my fields, the goal is to draw down the pea levels. So planter starter fertilizer is sufficient to supply the need, early needs of the plant. Thus my preference to use an appropriate mix of plants, roots, and the soil biology that they support to do that tillage for me. Thus the biostrip approach. My first try at biostrips was this past year and it's part of the on-farm project to, seeding radish into wheat stubble, single cut red clover. With the RTK auto steer that was installed in my Amex 120 in the fall of 19 
and with some adjustments to the Great Plains 1205 no-till drill, twin rows, so seven and a half inches apart of radish were seeded on 30 inch centers. Next slide. To reduce the damage to the single red cut red clover, I removed the coulters on the non-seeding rows and covered up the seed rolls in the small seed box on those rows. Radish was seeded on August 11th, where the red clover was thin. Next slide. Um, the radish established well, but where the red clover was dense and lush, the radish did not establish at all. Hindsight would suggest you can go through these three in a row kind of thing, oh. basically a month apart each. Hindsight would suggest that maybe we should have terminated or at least stung the red clover to give the radish a chance. But I'll take the lush red clover and make changes to the BioStrip program this year. So the plan for this year, I've got two wheat fields that will not be underseeded to red clover. The one field had two applications of a group two herbicide in 2020, classic as Guardian Max in the spring as part of the burn down, and then peak with partner in this fall or this past fall in the wheat, both targeted at the wild carrot that was getting ahead of me in that field. Work at Ridgetown campus of the University of Guelph by Darren Robinson has shown that group two herbicides have a negative impact on red clover establishment in wheat. The other field needs to have the final leveling of the tile runs established in the fall of 18. The thought on the first field is an oat based cover crop to be taken off as a forage crop with the overwintering species in the wheel tracks. The other field, the plan is to go with a winter terminated mix in the bio strips and another mix with some overwintering species in the wheel tracks. Some presentations that I've uh, listened to, watched uh, at the, from the Ontario Ag Conference and from Dr. Abby Wick from North Dakota have given me ideas on species to use. The more experienced biostrip speakers later in this session will probably give me more ideas for species selection as well. Then it will depend on what's available, how those seeds mix in the drill, and figuring out what drill setting will give the desired populations. As you can see in the picture, Patrick has used my drill before for his relay cropping seeding. So he has made dividers that will allow separation of the drill box into different mixes. So if I'm really keen, I could have a diff slightly different mix in each compartment to see what works best. We'll think about that more as we approach seeding time in August. As with many things, we don't have to reinvent the wheel to just, to, we just need to be observant and listen and then learn from that. That will be me as we continue the set, this session on biostrips. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Nick. That was great. Uh, next, we have Doug Rogers. Doug is a multi-generational farmer born and raised on the home farm that is located in the north part of Lambton Shores. Now this is his words, not mine. He has had the pleasure of working, he says, with me and St. Clair Conservation on a handful of projects uh, like cover crops and planting equipment. And we've worked together on um, doing some tile outlet water sampling on his farms. He has also won a Conservation Farm Award. Doug, uh, we just need you to share your screen and unmute when you have a chance. Great, we've got you unmuted and we can almost see your, perfect, we can see your screen. Thanks, Doug. Sorry, Jess, and thanks, Jess. Welcome. 
So as you can see, we have been around a long time. In this picture here is the seventh generation on the home farm. So you think by now that we would actually have this farming thing figured out. Oh, she's not advancing. Here we are. Let's go. So here, so thanks. Or this is our location of our farm. We're about, about one kilometer from the shores of Lake Huron. So this is one of my motivational factors of why we have changed our farming practices. We converted to a no-till ridge till system in 1990 and transitioned to cover crops in 2010. So this is one of two grass waterways implemented on the farm. Just take note that this farm looks fairly, fairly flat from this picture. So as you can see, this is the why the grass waterways are implemented. There's over 100 acres that are shaped and directed down this waterway. There's actually seven to nine feet of fall from that bush line to the front where we can see where the creek is uh, or the ditch is running. It is hard to see, but the surface water is running a lot clearer than the brown rudder water running in the ditch. So of course, this is my one of my top priorities to stop any soil erosion from leaving and stop any soil pollution in our waterways. There is one thing that I know for sure, that rainwater is clear and snow is white and when it melts is clear. It is not the color of the water that we see in the ditch down front. So how did I stop this? We started a monoculture cover crop back in 2010, started with oats. And like many rookies, I planted way too thick and learned some lessons the hard way. So after a couple of years, uh, we moved into a multi-species with some species that would overwinter. So that when we had the winter thaw or the spring rains, we still had living roots and lots of plants that were frosted off that left lots of armor on the soil. So now we have moved to the bile strips. So these are actually twin row strips. It's a little hard to see maybe, but you should be able to see the two different strips. So what I forgot to mention was that we have worked in a controlled traffic and planted all row crops like soy, sunflowers and corn in the same row since 1990. So the rows where I'm going to plant next spring, we have planted oats, radish and fava beans or an Austrian pea. But all those species will frost off. So in the spring, it just leaves a nice little armor on top of the soil, but protects from the spring rain and the soil erosion is eliminated. So the radish acts like a strip till without tilling the soil. I call it the poor man's strip till unit. So here we are, and now it's quite visible. This is in December and after many frost, just look at how much green there's still photosynthesizing, still putting carbon in the soil with lots of root exudates. So now it is showing up. The darker strips are next spring's planting zone as the oats and the radish and the faba have been frozen off. So here we are in the middle of January, still green and still photosynthesizing. So what is green is cereal rye and crimson clover and a little bit of volunteer wheat as I don't take this straw off, I blow all the straw back on. So we have some volunteer wheat. All this will survive the winter. Now, there was also in that strip was flax, buckwheat and sunflower. But by now they have been frozen off. But before they froze off, were, they were pollinator plants for all the insects and the bees. Of course, the buckwheat, the buckwheat with white flowers first, usually within six weeks of planting. Then the flax uh, follows up with purple flowers, the whole stem. And then the sunflowers pop out as long as we don't get an early frost like we did this past September that killed all three of those plants. 
So here is a sample of my bile strip mix and a cost per acre. The one thing with bile strips is you can adjust and tweak the species for the crop that you're going to plant in the spring. Example, if I was going to plant corn, I would have maybe a couple more legumes that would produce more end fixing. So then you would apply less synthetic end. So after this mix, I'm planting soys and sunflowers into it. But in the spring, it will look like I'm planting green. But the strips are frosted off and the strips between are still green. Great for wheel traffic to drive on and for slugs to munch on. But in the 10 years, I've only had one year with some slug damage. Termination has never been before planting and is always or usually a few days after or a week. We also with a pass, follow with a pass of the roller crimper. And that just helps lay things down for more weed suppression. And of course, lots of armor on the surface to stop all that soil erosion from wind or the rain. So in closing, I'm still tweaking the species rates, mainly have been increasing cereal rye to get more weed suppression for the in-between rows. All in all, pretty happy with how the bio strips are performing. Definitely will be staying with the bio strips. As I learn more about what individual cover crops can do, example, we know buckwheat retrieves phosphorus. Sunflowers helps retrieve zinc. Oats are a very mycorrhizae friendly plant. So with this system in place, I know that my soil losses from wind and rain are almost totally eliminated compared to a province average loss of three to four tons without having a large rain vent. So I can say for sure that we have achieved one of our goals. Thanks, Jess, that's all I have. Thanks, Doug. Uh, next, we have um, Dustin Mulock of Mulock Farms Limited in Woodville. He, uh, Doug, oh, sorry, Doug, Dustin uh, has adapted to no-till in the mid eighties. He uses a multi-species cover crop. Um, and has created a regenerative ag uh, production program in more recent history. Dustin believes that healthy soil is achieved with healthy plants and healthy plants need a complete soil food web. Dustin is a father of six with a Bachelor of Commerce degree majoring in ag business from the University of Guelph. He is the owner of Quartha Cover Crops specializing in multi-species cover crops and regenerative ag consulting. Thanks, Dustin. Let's get this fired up here. You guys Great. see my screen there now? Yep, we can see yeah, it excellent. and we can hear you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jessica, for the introduction and for the opportunity to be here. Um, take you through a quick little journey that we have been working with here over the last few years. Um, just uh, on who I am, we are in the Woodville area. This is an hour and a half north of uh, Toronto, Ontario. Uh, so we're a 2,600 heat unit, 2,700 heat area, depending on the year. And we work on sandy loam soils. We deal with a moisture reduction problem. Uh, we do not have the heavy clays to work with. Our journey did start back in 2012 with the Innovative Farmers Conference when Justin Michon came and spoke to us about our tons and bushels that he did not enjoy, but he was the first one to uh, bring the idea to the table in my mind of using precision place plants to do specific jobs uh, in the place uh, to replace both iron and herbicides. So his plan then was to use just rye in the, in the twin rows uh, to suppress weeds throughout the season. And he would plant it into that warm strip with his uh, strip warming machine in the picture. We at that time had, uh, since 2002, we're using strip till for our corn, um, come off of uh, Ross and Coulter carts, etc. before that with great success, but we could never dial in on the right machine for us. We are no-till at heart, 
and we couldn't bring ourselves to, to do anything otherwise. But we tried seven different machines and none of them worked the way that we wanted to. They were, they were great success, but still too many stones and too much stone disruption. So we sat back and we looked at us and why can't we do things with plants? And that's where the BioScripto came to life. We used the uh, twin row rye for the first year, we had weed suppression in between, but then suddenly we realized, you know, we can't keep ripping the soil up, let's use these roots to do the work. So what you're looking at here is uh, the John Deere air seeder. Uh, it's a, ours is a three tank machine, but a two tank is, is no different with double shoot. Uh, on the outsides in the left top left-hand picture, uh, are the regular uh, uh, towers that came with the air seeder. In the center is, a, is an extra tower that I've added. I've added three towers across the machine. The right hand picture shows you more clearly that the seeds that are blown to the double shoot to that new center tower are wide into uh, the existing lines in the previous tower. And inside that uh, black cap, the, there's a little cork put in that hole. So now we're able to uh, deliver the seed to the exact row that we want to without with minimal amount of uh, disruption and uh, actually it's really fast change over two for us when we're switching back and forth. Uh, some of our mixes I want to show you there that we're varying in seed sizes all over the map and we're always planning to the depth of the largest seed and relying on the uh, plants to um, the, the bigger plants to help push up the, the smaller plants. So here's what it looks like when things start to come to life. <clears throat> this will be in early September. Uh, we'll try to get them planted by first week of August uh, to the middle of August, depending on when our wheat harvest happens. But on the left, you'll see this is our vial strip. This is very similar to what was just mentioned by the previous speakers, but this strip here is going to be where, where the corn is going to go. Uh, that's all going to winter kill. Every species in there will winter kill. Right now, we have plants in there that are deep rooted. We have plants that are in there are, are very fine rooted, very shallow. Uh, anything to create that tilt, to loosen that soil uh, and, and do the, the work of what should be or what has traditionally been hiring. The biomass row pictured in the center, that's going to be our production for weed suppression and wheel traffic the following year. And you see here in another picture, things are progressing. The winter killing bio strips are establishing faster, the roots are pushing down, they're doing that soil fracture. Uh, then the grass crops, of course, are chasing along behind that. Just as a side note, these are really fun to play with your kids. You can have a lot of uh, sword wars and things of that nature. Uh, the kids really take well to this sort of thing. This is where it begins very interesting for us. This is in between the bile strip. The worm activity is becoming, uh, is, 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 is becoming beautiful. We have uh, the residue structure being turned in very quickly with the soil being loosened by the root aspects and the microbiology causing our aggregation. We're getting better water infiltration here in season uh, for our following corn crop. When you dig that row up with a shovel, this is what we're looking at. Uh, it is the intermeshing of uh, 15 different species. The roots all intermeshing and tying together. And the purpose of using this twin row design at the seven and a half inches apart is that when these roots tie together and begin to uh, grow together, they're going to die in the wintertime, but the roots still exist. So when we get our freezing frost here, this is going to heave as one unit. And we're getting soil fracture, compaction reduction, all without the use of diesel fuel. In the spring, Doug did a very good job of showing us what this looks like. It can look like a mess. <clears throat> and personally, the messier the better. A lot of people, this will give you a heart attack. But this is extremely easy to plant through. That hairy vetch is leaning out of the rows. Um, and I did forget to mention that we're using clovers and hairy, hairy vetch along with the rye in these strips, in these uh, bio, uh, biomass strips to overwinter because hairy vetch is just excellent at producing nitrogen and very easy to kill. Uh, it's a lead, nitrogen, carbon nitrogen ratio of 11 to one. So it melts away very, very quickly and gives back nitrogen or corn very quickly. The rye on the other hand is tying up that, the nitrates in the soil and suppressing the weeds, especially when it lays down on top of soil. But don't let the, the look of that scare you. It, uh, it does a really nice job. Looking down from above, we're cutting off light. Uh, even early on, we're using up nutrients uh, and storing them and converting them to plant available form later to be given back to the corn. So we have 
we have taken it one step further. There's a poor picture. I, I don't tend to stop very much. My hand working, don't tend to be in too much of a hurry. But this is a killed out spot where the water sat and the bows and, and the bows were killed out. What I want you to take note of is in drier areas, we can't grow as good of a biomass crop in the spring without using too much water compared to we can in the year before. So what we've done is we, in that bio strip row, sorry, in that, um, that uh, bio mass row, we're incorporating plants like uh, pearl millet or Sudan grass, oats, barley, that will put on their bio mass the season before. And so they will winter kill and die, but the rye, hairy vetch and uh, clovers will continue to grow, of course. But we have already created biomass and soil cover from the season before, so we do not have to rely on a massive growth in the spring, especially if it's cold and backwards. So what I say there is we're using water from the year before rather, rather than water from this current planting season. Uh, that system is working very well for us. In the spring, when we're planting our corn, etc., through it, you know, drive on the green, plant in between. The root systems are holding our, our machines up. Uh, what I love the most about it is the clean equipment. If we get a whole, all of our acres covered green, we barely have to wash them when we're finished. We have very little dust being kicked up. Filtering expense has gone down. In the top left-hand corner, you can see our, our rye roots just pull out of the ground. We have active microbiology functioning. We got the rasta roots. We have the rhizosphere functioning, collecting up that nitrates, <clears throat> suppressing weeds, uh, beginning to prime the system for that corn so we can have a happy takeoff. When you dig the row down um, after the corn, that corn somewhere in the B5, B6 stage, when we dug down and we just flaked it away, you can see the root systems down deep. And, they, and then the, the tilled loose soil, fractured soil, the aggregation. This corn is having very little effort down, uh, very little energy into growing the roots down. They're naturally following the, uh, the aggregation of the soil structure. This is making our corn stronger, happier, and it's also increasing our water in infiltration. So here's what it'll look like when we lay that biomass down. We're getting that weed suppression. Uh, rye at the proper height will go down very easily. We'll follow this with a roller crimper to lay it flat. As the corn grows, we have our biomass suppressing our, uh, our, our weeds, but also suppressing the loss of moisture and uh, heat stress. And that's twin row corn growing in between it there. In canopy, we now have most of our sunshine being caught by our corn, but we still have a worm food. We still have microbiology food. We still have a uh, climate underneath that that is inducive, uh, conducive to um, my microbiology staying alive. And because we're working with nitrofixing bacteria, zotobacter, et cetera, we wanna keep that soil moist. And this is the best way to do that. It keeps our function, it keeps our nitrogen production going. Here's a little experiment we did with the, with the actual effects of this. On the left is the biostriptil with the soil armor. We're looking at somewhere around the 82 degrees. It's a little hard to see there. It's a 100 degree day, 95, 100 degree day. But this, the soil temperature is only around 82 degrees. On the left, 10 feet away is just strictly no-till, and we have buried the needle. We're well over the 100 degrees. Our microbes are beginning to hurt. At the same time, our moisture levels are greatly increased. On the left with the biostrip, we're still five and a half, six. Uh, on the two inch level and on the no-till, we are getting into the red zone. We are drying out very quickly because of that, of that exposure. Last thing I wanna share with you here is the beautiful weed suppression that uh, we can receive from the Pro program. No, we do not have um, a living organism growing in between those two uh, biomass rows. But as you can see on the left-hand side of the picture where there was no cover crop grown, the strip was left out with a, with a mistake with the planter. With the, that's, a, that's, a, that's a natural annual ryegrass that we fight with here. On the right hand side, there's none of it. Just the presence of the, of the cover crop suppressing in the fall and then tying up the nitrates in the spring, we didn't see it return. So we're having a huge um, herbicide savings, even with the bios, even with the corner strips dying in, 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 in the wintertime. But that's what I have there for you folks. Thanks. Wow, Dustin, that last photo is pretty cool. Thanks for sharing that. And our final speaker on uh, BioStrips this morning is Stefan Zetner, who is a cash crop farmer, the owner of Huron Cover Crops. And Stefan is a no-till and cover crop enthusiast. Thanks.
All right, thanks for having me. Uh, sorry, I don't have a video. I've just got audio, and I hope everybody can hear me fine. Yep, we can hear you, and we can see your slides. So uh, today I'm going to talk to you not so much about um, what I am doing so much on my farm, but uh, what a bunch of customers of mine are uh, are trying and uh, I guess the direction that I'm trying to get them to go in. Um, so I am the owner of Huron Cover Crops, which is in Hensel, Ontario, and uh, I've been helping people with cover crop seed for a number of years now. Um, it's relates to bio strips probably uh the two people that have uh, gone into it uh, the most instead of all my customers are lawrence hogan and, and steve howard uh they're north of godrich uh kind of close to dungannon area i guess i would say um they've been playing with us for quite a few years i think i've been helping them on their mixes now for three years and as much as we make some slight changes every year um this is kind of the, the mix that we've we've come up with uh, for them. At first, you see the price there, and all the prices in my slides are just retail prices to kind of give you a rough idea of, you know, what some of this stuff costs, because I, uh, it's probably the number one question I get after a presentation like Lawrence and Steve's, uh, they've done a few this year, is what, what does something like that cost, and how can you do that for, uh, how can you spend that kind of money and expect to get it back again? Uh, and in the case of Lawrence and Steve, they've gone 100% no-till and uh, through the savings of labor and equipment and things like that, they have no problem spending a little bit more money on their cover crop seed. So the corn row mix um, is Austrian winter peas, chickling vetch, faba beans, sunflowers, and phacelia. Um, the idea behind that combination is Austrian winter peas if from all of my research data seems to be showing the biggest yield bump on the following corn crop. Um, chickling vetch is the first of all those legume crops to flower and is the first one to really start producing nitrogen so it's, it's quick quick out of the ground. Um, Faba beans produce a lot of nitrogen, but the main reason we, we, we're really focusing on the faba beans, or I really like the faba beans in, in a, in a biostrip situation, is that when they die off, they turn black, and I have a picture of that to show later. Um, sunflowers, same thing. When they die, the residue is black. Um, helps, helps the soil warm up in the springtime. And we, we've added phacelia into this mix, um, and we've really struggled to keep it in suspension in that mix. Um, it's a very, very small seed. Um, we've tried different things like adding map and adding a couple other small seeded things uh, to try to keep it more in suspension, but it is very hard with all those large seeded uh, species to keep that facilia um, equal throughout. Uh, the wheel track mix is oats, barley, rye. Um, the oats and the barley come on strong. The, the barley will, will come on first, uh, then the oats will kind of take over, and then the, those both will die over the winter, and the rye is still there in the spring. Uh, pearl millet and sorghum sedan grass, as mentioned uh, by Dustin, it's, it's nice to get some species to build some biomass in the fall, um, even though they will not survive the winter. Um, in some spots that get drowned out or winter kill, it's nice to have that, that lasting residue there. Um, then the small seeded legumes, we've played with winter lentils. I've been quite happy with them. Um, they're, they're quite winter hardy. They're more winter hardy than Austrian winter peas. Um, and it's just something that doesn't seem to get much attention, but we, we've had quite good luck with them. Uh, the fixation Balanza clover is probably one of my, my favorite clovers. Uh, very winter hardy and easy to work with come springtime. Uh, I believe that last picture that you've seen on Doug Rogers' presentation uh, was was Balanza clover, which is all those white flowers in between the twin row rye. Um, crimson clover is more uh, more known about, I guess, but is not nearly as winter hardy as the uh, the fixation Balanza clover. We added some red clover, hairy vetch, and flax, um, and we've been really happy with this mix, but we make little changes every year and the big change this year is fixation balanza clover is pretty much sold out. They had a uh, production issue in Oregon and I don't think we're going to see any in time, but we'll see. So this is a few pictures of their bio strips. You can kind of see the, uh, the rows over here with the sorghum sedan. 
uh, or the wheel track mix. And in the middle here, what you see that first flower there, that's chickling vetch. So that was the picture he took was the first flower he's seen out in the field. This is a little later on. You can see the sorghum sedan grass getting taller. Some sunflowers starting to open up their heads. We have a fallow bean down in the bottom here. And this is a chickling vetch again. Uh, the reason I showed this picture is I haven't been able to find another legume that consistently puts on nodules the size of golf balls. And I've seen this with my customers in PEI and New Brunswick uh, a lot more than I see it in Ontario, but I see it here too. And it's, it's pretty impressive. What chickling vetch doesn't work for everyone as well as it does uh, for some others. But where it does work, it is an amazing plant. Um, it's not cheap, but it uh, it does does do very well. Uh, this picture isn't really good quality, but I just wanted to throw it in quickly because it shows that this residue, um, the black residue you see here, the tall ones, the sunflowers, the slightly shorter ones are faba beans. And you see how black that residue is. If you could have a whole strip of that um, in the springtime, it's going to warm up a lot quicker than a whole bunch of this almost white tan straw that you get from the oats and some other other the grasses. So I've kind of spent a few minutes last night and made up a couple mixes that I think are maybe a slightly simpler version of what uh, what what Lawrence is doing. Um, we kept it to two species in the corn row mix. So 18 pounds of fava beans and two pounds of sunflowers get it as black as possible. Uh, wheel track mix, just oats and rye, some sorghum, sedan grass, hairy vetch and flax. And you can see there, that's about $5 an acre cheaper than, uh, than the mix that Lawrence and Steve are using. But I think we'll get a lot of the, uh, we'll achieve a lot of the same goals, I guess, at the end of the day. Um, to take it down one step again, because I have a lot of people that are extremely scared of hairy vetch and things like that. Um, this year I've, I've, I think I have six varieties of Austrian winter peas. Uh, the one that I'm mainly going with is icicle. It seems to be, seems to do quite well. Um, so I went with a, a winter hardy Austrian winter pea. The most of the common Austrian winter peas you find here are only so, so at overwintering, but there are new varieties that are, are very winter hardy. So this kind of mix, I would suggest being planted the very last last week of August uh, to the first part of September, you really don't need a whole lot of early growth to ensure that these Austrian winter peas will survive the winter. If they get too big, they won't survive. So I, I like, I really like that mix for $25 an acre roughly. Um, I think that's a good, good starting point with, with something that's still overwinters. Um, and then to take it one step further back for the people that are, are not really a big idea of anything overwintering, I, the corn row mix, again, I'm, I'm sticking with that. And then oats and Austrian winter peas, but just a common Austrian winter pea at a, at a fairly low rate. Uh, now we're back down to $20 an acre or less. Um, and, and, and in a price range that a lot of people say, okay, well, that's, that's something I'd, I'd be willing to try. Um, a lot of guys kind of get shocked when I say, okay, well, they want to do something. And then I say, well, it's going to be $30 an acre in seed. And it's, it's a lot of money when, uh, when you've got to pay for all of that. Um, going to soybeans rather than corn. I just threw an example here in as well. Um, Doug's doing a great job. I, I like his mix, but I just I threw in a very simple one. So oats and buckwheat in the soybean row, um, and then barley and rye in the wheel track mix. And that way you've got all three of your, you've got three cereals there. The barley's better at, at making or, or tying up uh, phosphorus than the oats is and just, and will make a heavier carbon residue quicker. So just a, a very simple soybean bio strip mix. I thought I'd throw an idea, idea in and, and price wise very cheap because there's no legumes. So, and finally, I just wanted to uh, end off, I guess, with, um, different ways of incorporating cereal rye. Um, I get a lot of phone calls and questions about planting green and very, a lot of people very um, unsure of how well this is all going to work. And what I've found over the years that works really easy is not necessarily planting your, your rye in, in solid seeded. And you've seen some examples of that today. Um, so solid seeded, I always recommend about 40 pounds the acre for easy planting green. Um, you have to go higher than that if you're in an organic situation, but if you just want a nice cover of green out there and easy to plant, 
uh, 40 pounds is, is about where I suggest people to start. Um, if you go to more of a twin row seeded cereal rye, um, followed with twin row soybeans or strip till edible beans in between there, you can cut that seeding rate in half, um, save some money that way, or really push the seeding rate, I guess, in the, uh, in that twin strip, cause you're, you're not going to have anything planting there in the spring anyways. Um, then 15 inch seeded cereal rye. I've, I've seen a few customers do a great job of this. They'll go out and seed cereal rye in 15 inch rows and then, and move their drill over seven and a half inches and come back in with 15 inch soybeans. And, uh, it, it works really well. And you've, you've got very good coverage, um, of your whole field actually at 15 inch rye, if it, if it's seeded early enough and then twin row seeded cereal rye and 15 inch I have one customer that does this year and he's really happy with it. He literally drives on the same plant, uh, same pass, plants his uh, rye with the drill on twin rows and then places the soybeans just on either side of that, that, that twin row with his 15 inch planter and, and it works quite well. And here I just threw in a couple pictures to, to show you the, that's twin row rows. Um, a good good chunk of that ground is covered, but it's quite easy to come in and install those soybeans in between the. So just what, uh, what works best for you, I guess. And that's all I have. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Stefan. And I really appreciate that you were able to break down like different packages that um, that farmers could like see the see the costs whether it's um, 30 dollars or 17 dollars an acre I think that helps and um, helps to yeah to know your costs up front and if you're gonna try if you're gonna start into this we do have some questions. Uh, the first question is actually for Stefan. Would uh, you recommend, what would you recommend, or sorry, would you recommend these mixes that you've listed today for all soil types? For example, heavy clays down in Essex region um, and parts of Lambton. Uh, the idea of having black residue is interesting and are there any data to support warmer temperatures? Um, depending on the soil types, we definitely do change things. Um, sandy type soils, we, we try to avoid too much rye to keep, keep the ground from, uh, drying out in the spring, heavier soils, um, cereal rye doesn't always do that well. Sometimes we, we use annual rye grass there. Um, there is different, you can definitely tweak it depending on, on soil types. Um, and I think on a, on a heavier clay, the, the black strips, um, seem to show more. We have some very heavy ground ourselves just outside of Grand Bend uh, on the Osabo River. And uh, as much as we don't have a ton of really heavy clay, I, I do get some experience with it. And, and you can definitely tell where there's a, a good strip of sunflowers and the residue is very black every year. And when I check soil temps, it's, it's always warmer. Um, I don't have any actual articles or anything to, to really eat to, but it, it, from my experience, it definitely does work. And, um... Dustin, Doug, Nick, or Patrick, do you want to add to that about noticing your own your own fields looking warmer? I know Dustin, you were showing cooler in the summer. Yeah, uh, for us, um, when we take our, our our soil thermometer out, you know, we are seeing warmer temperatures. We're able to get out there faster. Not even so much based on the warmer temperatures, but we're able to travel on top of that uh, rye that's giving us a safe zone to put the weight of that equipment out there so a, a, the two are combined um but it, even more so that that early early traffic is something that's a, a real benefit for us i think yeah. the only thing i would add is i think we're finding and dustin you'll probably uh reaffirm this that we're getting some warmth from the biological activity just having green, just having something green and growing, I think we're seeing uh, a warm up in the soil just from that. Yeah, for sure. We're causing that activity. Um, you can really tell when your biology turns on in the spring when you have rye in the field, 
when that ride begins to take off and grow and uh, really bolt, that's when your biology is really turning on. So it's an excellent indicator that things are beginning to process and happen. I'm, I'm a little too early into the bio strip stuff, but I have done some cereal rye on 15 inch rows or twin rows. And uh, I really liked what it did for the, the soil as far as, uh, you know, making it more plantable. And uh, just as you said, as Dustin said, uh, the soil biology just kicking that into gear. And we have another question. Uh, would you plant buckwheat in the corn row track with the faba beans and sunflower? Don't know if that's directed to anyone, but. What I found with buckwheat is uh, it not a huge corn boost uh, the following year, but you'll notice where the buckwheat was, the soybean crop after, uh, after the corn crop, you will see a bump in it. Um, I don't know why that is, but uh, I grew five acres of buckwheat in the middle of a big field once. And the corn there was absolutely no better the following year, but uh, two years later, uh, you could you could tell that the beans, there was a little patch there. We forgot what it was, but it came back to being uh, our little five acre plot of buckwheat that we had. And it was, it was a big yield bump on the beans two years later. From my experience on that, um, what Stefan sees, yes, in, in the soybeans for sure, um, Buckwheat's got the ability to produce a very strong root exudate acid that creates an environment around its root that um, promotes the, the phosphorus fixing or uh, solubilizing um, bacteria and microbes to go to work, releasing that, that phosphorus availability. So most soybean plants, the way they get a better uh, phosphorus um, pick up the following year. We use them heavily in our systems and in that corn row. Uh, they're all winter kill when we plant it. August 15th, um, the, in my climate, I have a killing frost here right around um, Thanksgiving. I will not see buckwheat make seed. It will form a seed, but it will not be finished. Um, personally, not afraid of the buckwheat anyway. Easy to kill, easy to take care of in our conventional systems. And I know from just discussions with you guys that slugs, though ever, like that seems to be a common fear with biostrips or cover crops in general, how are you finding that you're finding that the biostrip row is attracting them? Anyone want to jump in? Uh, you and I did discuss that when we talked earlier on. Um, we specifically started the biostrips in early on because of the fear of slugs, right? We're coming out of no-till. Um, and so we said, wait, let's, let's leave a spot that's clear. Uh, let's try not to encourage them, et cetera. But as we've gone along, we've realized that the growing of cover crops, whether it's solid, stand, or bio is the answer to, to controlling slug. Um, my favorite uh, way to look at this is the analogy of a garbage can. If I were to lock Jessica into a locked room for a week, and I didn't feed her, and I didn't give her any water, but at the end of that week, I released her and I have waiting for her a garbage can with semi-rotten food. Do you think that, that she's going to eat it? Would you eat it, Jessica? Well, I guess so, yes, if in I've order, been locked up. <laughs> in order to survive, you're going to eat something, right? And that's yeah. no different with that poor mollusk. That little slug is coming out of hibernation. If we have a dead, stale seed bed, when he comes out, he, he she comes out, they have nothing to eat. They're going to go after the first thing that they can find. And if that's your corn plant or your soybean plant popping out of the ground, they're going to munch it. If they have a buffet of rye and hairy vetch, et cetera, popping out of the ground first, they've got something to munch on. Now they're not even going to notice that your corn has popped up after that. And we've had zero slug feeding in our own personal uh, events here. I think that's something that uh, Dr. Tucker out of uh, Pennsylvania has found as well. And, and some of the guys like Lucas Criswell and stuff like that, that are planting more into, into green material are finding that the slugs are leaving their, uh, the crop and uh, just going to the, the green material. Awesome. Um, we don't actually have any more questions uh, and it is already after 12 and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, I just need to share my screen so that people can see the um, CEU credits. 
I am also going to whoops, one more. If you could um, fill in the poll, uh, that would be really helpful for us in our um, in our metrics. Um, I want to thank everyone for the questions that you gave to us. Uh, thank you to our panelists and thank you to our funders. Do we have a last bit? Oh, no, not, no more questions popping in. Uh, if you are a certified crop advisor, here is the uh, QR code. If you're having trouble with it, you can definitely just email me your uh, CCA number and I'll make sure you get or that I send off the um, your number to um, where it needs to go. I can't remember the name at the, the, off the top of my head, sorry. Um, and I would just like to say thank you and uh, join us again next week, same time, same link for a fan, farm panel discussion of equipment modifications for nutrient management. Thanks everyone and have a great day. Thank you, Jessica. Thank Have a good day, guys. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, everyone.